I'm actually just going to do the backwards of my earlier talk. <laughs> uh, my disclosures again. So we have uh, actually a case that has a couple of different iterations. Um, you all have your audience response uh, devices. Um, and so I expect there to be participation. A 52-year-old man presents for evaluation after being found to have an elevated lymphocyte count on routine CBC. His CBC demonstrated a white blood count of 22,000, hemoglobin 13.9, and platelets of 155. He demonstrates no lymphadenopathy or organomegaly and is otherwise asymptomatic. He is CD38 positive, ZAP70 positive, and unmutated IGHV. Appropriate, manage, appropriate management at this point in time includes A, watch and wait, B, obtain a baseline PET scan, C, initiate therapy with FCR given the mutational status and ZEP70 results, initiate therapy with ibrutinib given the mutational status and ZAP70 results, refer for bone marrow transplant evaluation given the age of this patient and the prognostic markers, or initiate therapy with BR given the decreased risk of uh, secondary myeloid neoplasia seen with BR compared to FCR. Shouldn't there be music? <laughs> if I don't get music, I'm going to sing. Okay. You can continue. Is it just? Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> now late. we'll have music <laughs> for the rest of your talk. <laughs> <laughs> so most people uh, picked what I would have thought would have been the correct answer, which was watch and wait. You know, this patient is asymptomatic, and we currently don't have any data regarding early intervention in our patients who are at high risk of progression. But what I would like to point out is that we know if we were to treat patients who have unmutated immunoglobulin genes or ZAP70 ZAP positivity or CD38 positivity, we really don't have any data that they would actually do worse with ibrutinib or FCR treatment if you wait and treat them when they meet IWCLL indications. In fact, there's some interesting data looking at the OSU cohort of patients where if you're not complex karyotype and not 17P deleted and um, over the age of 65, you have a 98.1% chance of being free from progression of seven years on ibrutinib. So clearly the people, you know, genomic instability, I think, really is the most important predictor, and that these patients could do well even just watching, waiting them. All right, correct statements regarding the prognostic factors include ZAP70 and CD38 results play a role in planning the timing. I spoke too soon. The timing of treatment. Bone marrow biopsy is required for most accurate assessment of prognostic factors. Interface FISH results um, play a role in the choice of therapy. Unmutated IGHV indicates no benefit from ibrutinib, and BTK sequencing should be performed as part of the prognostic panel. All right, so it seems we actually have a fairly good split here between ZAP70 and CD38 results playing a role in the timing of treatment, interface FISH playing a role in the choice of therapy, and BTK sequencing should be formed as a part of the prognostic panel. So let me just address these individually. So the ZAP70 and CD38, as I started to mention, really doesn't have a role to play in predicting uh, the timing of treatment. We still actually rely completely on what Dr. Rye gave us in 1973, which is the Rye stage, to determine when someone has progressed sufficiently to require therapy. One of the things that I believe is very important, and one of the things that I think will become a standard of therapy in the very distant future, is the idea that, you know, when we did the initial watch and wait studies in the 1970s, you know, it was at diagnosis, and patients were randomized to either chlorimicil prednisone or observation and chlorimicil prednisone at the time of treatment progression. 
what becomes important is to consider, A, um, that we have much better therapies now that are far less toxic, and B, you know, if you're not looking at diagnosis, but you're looking with a little bit of a retrospective scope, like so if I'm looking at a patient who's had CLL for a year and shown some signs of progression, that helps me identify what group of patients will eventually need treatment from those who won't. Additionally, if we're going to start using prognostic markers like ZAP70, CD38, unmutated immunoglobulin status, or interphase FISH, those will really help us identify which patients are also going to predict. So I think the watch and wait is sort of, it needs to be revisited. I think it's hard to watch and wait someone who you know is progressing, may not have a platelet count less than 100,000 or a hemoglobin less than 11 or massive lymphadenopathy. But certainly if you know their disease is progressing, you know, I do think earlier initiation of therapy before they start having a lot of consequences is something that will be um, not inappropriate in the not distant future. Arguably, people who have a risk of developing Richter's transformation, NOTCH1 mutated, TP53 mutated, uh, patients with stereotype V gene subsets, you know, the data suggests um, that all these changes that occur are occurring before the patients initiate therapy. So one of the important questions is if we initiate therapy earlier, can we stop those changes from happening? So I do believe that those groups may benefit from early initiation of therapy as well, but those are data that we still need to generate. Uh, regarding the interface, fish results play a choice in the role of therapy. Absolutely. So we know 17P deletion, this is a correct answer, 17P deletion does predict for um, poor response to chemoimmunotherapy. Uh, definitely we see that with bendamustine and uh, fludarabine-based therapies. Interestingly, everyone might remember from this CLL4 study, which was the German study group looking at fludarabine versus fludarabine cyclophosphamide, where fludarabine cyclophosphamide demonstrated a very significant improvement in outcome um, compared to fludarabine alone. But as it turns out, the vast majority of that benefit was really due to the 11Q deleted patients. And so if you looked at the non-11Q, non-17P deleted patients in that study, fludarabine and fludarabine cyclophosphamide did equally well. So when you look at the risk of secondary myeloid neoplasia, it's, there's a suggestion that really FC together, if far, <coughs> bless you, far more toxic and increased risk of secondary myeloid neoplasia compared to fludarabine alone. So theoretically, if one needed to give chemotherapy for a reason and a patient was not an 11Q-deleted patient but was trisomy 12 or 13Q or normal karyotype, you could justify that FR would be equivalent to FCR and far less toxic. So there I think, you know, IFISH results do help shed some light on differences in outcomes with treatment. Uh, regarding BTK sequencing, it's important to remember that we've never found a BTK mutation that predicts for resistance in a patient prior to initiating treatment with ibrutinib, or calibrutinib, or xanabrutinib. So the OSU has generated data where they've actually looked at their patients every three months by PCR and have identified BTK mutations or PLC gamma mutations emerging in their patients before they show signs of clinical progression. The big caveat, remember, is that these are patients who have responses and then are showing subtle signs of progressing, right? So these are patients with absolute lymphocyte counts of 2,000 or 1,500 cells per microliter who get PCR. So they're not progressing clinically, but we can actually find the PCR, um, the mutations by PCR six to 12 months before they do clinically progress. It's unclear if that really provides any benefit and that's an important catch. It's also important to remember that you're going to be doing PCR on a large number of people in order to pick up really, you know, 20 percent of patients who might be developing progression. So that's an important thing to think about. And so it's really an indicator that we, there's no need to do BTK um, assessment in patients before initiation of treatment. With ibrutinib, which IGHV marker is associated with a slower time to resolution of the lymphocytosis? Everyone's ready for the, the Marvel movie marathon this weekend? 
Okay, so actually unmutated uh, was picked over mutated. And what's important to remember with this is, as it turns out, the unmutated patients had a shorter time to normalization or resolution, rather, of the lymphocytosis. And the thought process is, is that they're probably just more dependent on the B cell receptor and therefore are quicker to clear. So the one prognostic marker in the original um, publication of ibrutinib, uh, which was Bird et al., showed that the one predictor for a worse outcome were, was mutational status, which is obviously very ironic. But when you look subsequently at later point, uh, marks, the actual difference goes away. It's also important to remember that the poorer outcome was actually based upon the fact that we just used CR and PR, and we didn't use PR with lymphocytosis. If you're going to use PR with lymphocytosis, actually the response rates are the same across the board. It's just the time to lymphocytosis that's delayed. All right, so the second part of the case. Over the next 12 months, his white blood count increases to 60,000 with a drop in the hemoglobin to 10.1 and platelets to 110,000. He has moderate lymphadenopathy but minimal splenomegaly. His eye fish at this time demonstrates a deletion of 17P in 55% of the cells. He has no other comorbidity, so he's a SEER score of 1. So this is a patient now who's showing some signs of progression with a drop in the platelet, a hemoglobin that actually makes him a rise stage 3, and significant amounts of lymphadenopathy. Current management strategy for this patient should be continued watch and wait given that the patient remains asymptomatic, initiation of therapy given the presence of 17P deletion on interphase fish, initiation of therapy given the presence of a hemoglobin in 10.1, wait until rise stage 3 or 4 to initiate therapy, use a binituzumab to lower the ALC prior to any treatment initiation. Do we have the uh, responses? Nope. Okay, so we don't have the responses. So um, the correct answer, or the answer in my opinion, really is that it's time to initiate therapy on this patient given the presence of the hemoglobin in 10.1. So this is a rise stage three patient. This is a patient who's shown progressive disease. And what I really want to emphasize is that, you know, we call treatment initiation or watch and wait continues until the patient shows symptoms. But they're really not symptoms. They're really signs. And I do see some patients who really have this idea that they want to delay initiating treatment as long as possible. And they'll keep delaying treatment until they're in extremis, until they're dragging themselves into the office with the hemoglobin of six. And it's really, really important that the whole idea behind watch and wait is to separate those patients who might go 20 years and not need treatment from those patients who are only going to be able to go five, six years without needing treatment. And so even as though this person is asymptomatic, they are rise stage three, and they do have significant tumor burden. So it is a patient who would be appropriate to initiate therapy in. Which of the following regimens will likely be ineffective for this patient? FCR, BR, idelalisib, uh, rituximab, obinutuzumab, chlorambucil, and ibrutinib. Not working. Oh, it's not working at all? Oh, so not even the choices. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let me just uh, answer the question. So, <laughs> all right, there we go. We got actually something. <laughs> so the truth of the matter is, is FCR, BR, and abinutuzumab really are going to be not effective for a patient with 17P deleted CLL. Uh, you know, some people talk about there being a difference in behavior when 17P when the in percentage of 17P is actually below 20%, but here we are 55% way above 
And so this is clearly a patient who would really need something that's going to be P53 independent, like idelisib or ibrutinib. Was there another slide? Ah. All right, so case 1A. So here's the modification. So we've changed the 17P deletion to a trisomy 12 and 40% of the cells. And by the way, remember, whenever you see trisomy 12, you have to think about a notch 1 mutation. So the most appropriate treatment option for this patient includes FCR, given the unmutated immunoglobulin gene, ibrutinib, given the unmutated immunoglobulin gene, FCR, given the trisomy 12, BR, given its lower risk of MDS and AML, and refer for bone marrow transplant evaluation given his age and prognostic markers. All right, so we finally got some music that's my, my <laughs> genre. So the uh, correct answer is, uh, or my answer is B, ibrutinib given the unmutated IGHV. So the key here is, is, you know, we really don't see FCR afford an advantage in the trisomy 12 population over FR, um, and we certainly don't see an advantage for the FCR based upon unmutated immunoglobulin status. In fact, remember, the patients who really derive the benefit from FCR were those who were mutated who had a 50.3% chance of being free from progression at 12.8 years, whereas for the unmutated group, it was actually only 8.7. So that's a very important, you know, concept to keep in mind. Um, regarding bone marrow transplant, I mean, none of those prognostic markers really indicate that this patient's going to have a bad outcome, and so this is not a patient who really would need uh, to be considered for a bone marrow transplant. So now we actually changed the patient to a mutated immunoglobulin gene, and we've actually made him a 13Q deleted patient. So this is a patient with a much better prognosis. Uh, same question, uh, same answers. All right, so this really is a personal opinion, and so there's really no correct answer here. I mean, I think either ibrutinib or FCR would be arguably the appropriate choices. I myself would choose ibrutinib because I am concerned about the long-term sequelae of FCR, but, you know, with a very good, honest conversation with the patient about the idea that with six months of therapy, they have a 50% chance of being free from progression that's certainly something that is um, going to be up to the patient to consider for themselves. Uh, which of the following statements is correct? Ibrutinib is more efficacious in IGHV, unmutated CLL compared to mutated. FCR is more efficacious in unmutated CLL compared to mutated CLL. Ibrutinib and FCR are equally efficacious in mutated CLL. And ibrutinib and FCR are equally efficacious in unmutated CLL. All right, so actually everyone did really well with this one. So really the data that we looked at from the Alliance study really suggested that there was no difference in the unmutated, I'm sorry, in the mutated immunoglobulin gene group who received FCR as compared to ibrutinib rituximab. And so it really does suggest that this is actually, you know, because this is a group that does so well with FCR chemotherapy, that that likely may not be, um, that the difference that we did see in the population overall might be completely due to the unmutated patients. Um, and so this is actually what I'm showing you overall. Um, in the interest of time, I'll go through these quickly. But there was no difference based upon immunoglobulin G mutational status. Um, these are data from the 1102 phase two study for the relapse refractory patients, um, both in overall survival and progression-free survival for ibrutinib-treated patients. 
Here you can see what I showed you earlier, which is that there is a significant difference between outcomes for FCR based upon mutational status. And when we look at the IR versus FCR data, I'm sorry, it's the ECOG study, not the uh, Align study, that you can see there was no difference for the mutated group, whereas there was a, actually an increased difference in the unmutated group. Um, and then I just want to remark again, as we've mentioned on a couple of questions so far, you know, patients with 17P deletion do really poorly with chemoimmunotherapy. And you can here see the uh, overall survival curve um, for patients who are 17P deleted treated with chemoimmunotherapy. And I thank you. Okay.